Hello, and welcome to the Applying to Dental School Made Easy presentation by DAT Bootcamp. I'll be your host today. My name is Alex, and you can find DAT Bootcamp on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. So let's get right into it. Our goal of today's presentation is to help you understand the dental school application process. We want to give you tips and strategies so you can present the most competitive application possible. So let's get started. This is the AdSAS application portal. Here we have the My Application tab, which is composed of four main components, your personal information, your academic history, your supporting information, and your program materials. Next to the My Application is Add Program, where you'll be adding dental school programs that you will want to apply to. Next to it, Submit Application, which is where you'll be submitting your application to certain schools. And lastly, we have this check status all the way in the far right. Now, what this check status does is it lets you know where your application stands in regards to each dental school program that you apply to. So for example, some schools may notify you and let you know that your application is complete, whether it is under review, whether there's an interview offer, or whether there's an offer of admission. All of this can be found right here on the check status. However, realize that because schools are still adjusting to the electronic system of, of submitting applications, not every school uses the check status equally. For example, some schools may leave you as application complete throughout the entire cycle or as none. And so if you see that, you can follow up with the school um, via telephone or email and ask where your application stands. But now let's dive deeper. Let's say we added a program and then we're going to go to program materials to figure out what we're dealing with. Here is an example of what the Indiana School of Dentistry looks like. Over here on the far left, we do see additional programs that I have applied to. Additionally, we see the Indiana School of Dentistry and we see that there's a prerequisites tab. This will let you know any prerequisite courses that this dental school program requires. Additionally, we see these questions. Now these questions can sometimes be referred to as a secondary application, which I'll get to later, or there could just be a few other questions that the dental school asks to get some more information from you. We also see the deadline right here for Indiana, which is also useful. There's a small introduction about the school that you could read. And then down here, this is called the applicant checklist. So let's scroll down there to see exactly what it means. So the application checklist gives you some very important information, such as the deadline that you saw at the top. It also tells you about certain recommendations that the school gives you, such as we recommend that you complete and submit your application as early as possible. Also, they give you some information about their letters of reference. So for example, Indiana University requires you to submit two letters from science professors, one letter from a non-science professor, and it gives you some information for the professor, um, although you don't really have to worry about that. However, it also gives you some, some other options. If, for example, you cannot get a non-science professor, it lets you know that an additional science professor letter would be okay, or if a professor is doing a lot of research, that letter will also be okay. Also, it lets you know that they also accept a committee letter package, and so you don't have to go through this process of going to each professor individually. They give you some information about the minimum number of shadowing hours that they require. And if we look down here, we talk a little bit about their application process, as well as some cutoffs that you may want to keep note of, such as um, a GPA cutoff or a D DAT score cutoff. And so you want to go through this, this sort of process for every dental school that you apply to to ensure that you're not getting filtered out from any schools and that you meet the requirements for every school. Moving on. I'm going to talk a little bit about each component of the application, which is essentially composed of five main parts, although technically six, but we'll get to that in a bit. So the application is composed of your GPA, your DAT score, your letters of reference, your experiences, as well as your personal statement. And I'll go through each of these individually so we get a better sense of what we're dealing with. So we're going to start with academics. This is your GPA and your DAT score. So what does a good GPA and a good DAT score do? It sort of opens the door towards more interview invites. However, keep in mind that dental schools follow what is called a holistic approach. And so academics are only one side of the coin. There's another side of the coin which has all of your experiences and your personal statement. And that's also important to consider. And so schools admit applicants with a very diverse range of scores. And this is best illustrated on the next slide. So here we see some ranges for a few schools that I have uh, picked. And so even if we look at a school like Harvard, which has a DAT range from 20 to 27, as you can see, applicants get accepted with a very broad range of scores, is essentially what I'm trying to say. And so don't get discouraged uh, about applying to certain programs just because they have a high DAT average. 
you may very well get into one of one of these schools and that, that would be awesome and so don't get discouraged additionally you could see that the gpa ranges also vary greatly now you may see that this these gpas go above a 4.0 and that's because prior to 2017 an a plus was considered a 4.3 and this data was taken from the entering class of 2016. and down here i have the average of what the entering um, or the first time in early in 2016 had and that was a 20 academic average and a cumulative gpa of 3.55 so now let's talk a little bit about the letters of reference. So there will be four slots available for you to upload letters uh, on the AdSAS portal. To cover your bases at most schools, you're looking for two science professor letters, one non-science non professor letter, and one dentist letter. However, keep in mind that every school has different requirements, such as Columbia University wants three science letters, and other schools may be fine with just two faculty letters, and they can be non-science and they can be science. So it's important to reference the AdSAS portal to see that you meet the requirements for every program you apply to. Also, if your school offers the committee letter package, you can just go with that and you don't have to go through all this. However, keep in mind that when you are getting letters, you wanna get strong reference letters. And so what do I mean by a strong reference letter? Um, if you only talk to your professor for, for a few days, or maybe you only went into a few office hours, you may not be getting a strong reference letter. You might just be getting a, neut a neutral reference letter, which doesn't help your application. A strong reference letter um, usually speaks to your abilities outside of the classroom. It speaks to your characteristics and your qualities. And so by speaking to your professor more often or keeping in contact with them, that's what will get you the strong reference letter. Additionally, if you want to take it to the next level, which is something that I did, is you want to keep in mind who your letter writer is, um, in a sense. So let's, let me explain this further. One of my letter writers was the chairman of the chemistry department at my university and obviously his letter carried a lot more weight than say an assistant professor so if you have that option of choosing say the dean of your program or the president of, you, of the university um, you may want to keep that in mind as it's these little small factors that can really boost your application um, a little tip that you could use is you could mark the committee letter as one and that way you'll be able to upload an additional letter down the line if you so choose to so now let's talk a little bit about the evaluations uh, further so this is back to the AdSAS portal on the, on the Supporting Informations tab. And this is where we see the evaluations. This is known as your letters of reference, your experiences, your achievements. So this would be any scholarships or awards or any competition um, awards that you got. They would go right here. Additionally, we have licenses. So if you have uh, some, point, some form of healthcare license, as well as your personal statement down below. So now let's go deeper into the evaluations to see exactly what the page looks like. So this is my uh, evaluations uh, tab. As you can see, it's already full with four evaluations, but this is where you would be adding your evaluators or your letter writers. So how this works is you would go and you would notify your professor and ask them if they can write you a letter. If they agree, then you can go back to this portal, fill out their information, uh, their first and last name um, and their email address, and AdSats will create a document for them to use and that's and they will follow those instructions to out upload the letter onto AdSAS. So essentially, all you have to do on your end is first let the professor know that you want them to write you a letter, and if they agree, then you would come here, fill out the information, and that information would be given to your professor. Um, and that's all you have to do on your end. However, keep in mind that when you're asking for a letter of reference, you wanna give your letter writer plenty of time to write the letter. I would say probably at least a month, ideally a month and a half to two months. Um, you also want to give them a deadline. Uh, when do you when do you want the letter by? Do you want it be do you want it by June fifth or do you want it by June first? I would say you want to start early and you want to give yourself plenty of room in case some some deadlines aren't met. So, for example, um, you want to say I want my letter by June first. One week before June first, you want to follow up with that professor to see how the letter is going. Maybe they forgot about it, and by letting them know now, they can write it for you. Um, this avoids any unnecessary delays on, on your end. Now let's talk a little bit about the experiences. So you're looking for eight to 10 quality experiences. And so what do I mean by quality experience? Um, so going to Miami and going to Ultra Music Festival for a weekend is not gonna constitute as a quality experience. A quality experience would be such as your shadowing experience, it would be your volunteering experience, your research, work experience, athletics, or any other extracurricular activities that you are a part of. Something that you wanna keep in mind 
is that you want to continue to be involved in certain experiences after your submission date. The application cycle does not end until you've gotten into your top choice or until you've gotten into a dental school that you're okay with. And so let's take a theoretical example that say come December 1st, you are waitlisted at a school. If you're able to provide that school with additional information, such as updating your shadowing, updating your volunteer hours, uh, maybe you did some research, something along those lines, that's going to look very favorably on you. Um, and that way, if they're comparing an applicant um, with similar characteristics or similar qualifications, and they're comparing that applicant and you, and you've done all this extra work, you're obviously going to look a lot better in their eyes, and they're going to more likely accept you versus the other applicant. A little bit more information about the experiences. When you're writing your experiences, you want to focus on your roles and your responsibilities. You want to focus on what skills you used or what skills you improved upon or that you learned. Um, for those of you who want to get ahead, the character limit is 600 characters without spaces. So essentially it's a large paragraph. And you also want to focus on the experiences that you gained during your college years. Um, you don't want to be talking about volunteering experience during your high school. Okay. So now let's dive down deeper into an experience that I use so we can get a, get a, so we can get a better sense of what we're dealing with. This is an experience type right here. So it says employment, recognition type, compensated, my title. Um, the experience date is located right here. The status, the hours per week, your total week, and your total hours. And your hours per week and total week will multiply to your total hours. When you're filling out your hours per week, I know some of you might say, well, one week I worked for five hours and the next week I worked for 10, what do I put? Just average it out and as long as your total hours is correct, and you can explain that in an interview, you'll be okay. So now let's read this experience so we can get a better sense for it. So I wrote, blank is a business venture and personal project that I have been working on with my partner. Our objective is to provide unique jewelry such as earrings to our customers. As the founder of the company, my responsibilities include project, product management and ordering, marketing and advertising, website maintenance, as well as customer relations. This project allows me to use my skills of leadership, professionalism, communication, business persuasion, and marketing to provide a unique product to our customers. So as you can see, firstly, I sort of outlined what the experience was. Then I talked a little bit about my roles and my responsibilities. And lastly, I mentioned the skills that were involved. And so this is a general guideline that you can follow when you're writing up your own experiences. Moving on, I want to talk a little bit about the personal statement. So your personal statement answers the question of why dentistry? Why did you choose to become why do you choose to become a dentist versus going on the path of, say, nursing or going into accounting? What was it about dentistry that attracted, to, that attracted you to the field? Was it because of the large manual dexterity involvement? Is it because you're constantly dealing with people? Is it because it's science-based? Is it because of the business aspect of dentistry? And so those are some things that you want to keep in mind that makes dentistry unique compared to other, other fields. And you want to incorporate that into your personal statement. You want it to be more of a story rather than an experience summary. Don't just take all of your experiences and put them into a personal statement. That's why the experiences section exists. It's okay to incorporate some of your experiences into your personal statement. And um, I recommend that you talk about like your shadowing, that would be really cool, or your volunteering. You wanna try to have a strong hook and a strong finish. Um, this essentially is the recency and primacy effect. And you wanna show passion, okay? Don't just say you're passionate about something. Demonstrate it through your personal statement. How you write your personal statement is going to give a large perception of who you are as a person when ad comms are reading it. And there's going to be a lot of editing involved. Um, I think my final version had, a, had around 20 edits. And so it's, it's a long process that you're not really going to get done overnight, essentially. And there's some examples available for you to find online on Student Doctor Network or in various Facebook groups. The ADA does give additional guidelines of what to focus on. Uh, when you're writing your personal statement, and so you can check them out with this website right here. A few other considerations is uh, if you're a professional athlete, you definitely want to let the school know this is going to be very favorable. If you're a legacy applicant, so if your parents went to the school before, you this is set, this works really well with private schools. Um, it really boosts your application. If you have any sort of faculty connection to the school, you also want to let them know or if you are a VIP, and this essentially means that if you're the son or daughter of a famous celebrity. All of these will really help your application. So a little bit about the important dates for the 2018 to the 2019 application cycle. So the AdSAS portal opens May 15th, and the 
official first day of submission is June 5th. So this means on May 15th, you're going to be able to add, access the AdSAS portal and you're going to be able to fill in some of your personal information, your supporting information, um, your personal statement, etc. What I'm trying to say is that you want to apply early. Um, what this means or what this does for you is because the interview cycle is based on rolling admissions. If your application is not in the pile, they can't offer you an interview invite. And so let's say I'm a dental school uh, program and come June 5th, I'm going to start getting applications submitted on my desk. I'm probably going to wait a few weeks until I get a nice pile and I'm going to start going through those applications. And I'm going to start offering interview invites to the best applicants from this pool. And so if your application is not in here, you're, I can't give you an interview invite. And so you sort of have a statistical advantage applying early. Uh, a general time frame that you want to keep in mind is uh, June to July is considered early. August is sort of the average time of admission of su submission. And September or later is considered the late submission. However, keep in mind that a later submission with a strong complete application is better than a weak application submitted early. And so you want to submit sort of the best application possible. And you also want to submit it as close to June 5th as you possibly can. Um, so just when you thought the fun was over, there's this thing that's called secondary applications, which I briefly mentioned earlier. And what secondary applications are, are just additional questions that dental schools ask you. Um, they, can talk, they can ask you about your weaknesses, your strengths, uh, why this particular school, etc. Some of these are, can be found on the AdSAS portal under the questions section, as I mentioned, and, other them, and others will email you the questions directly to you. Um, they are required by most schools, and they must be submitted for your application to be complete. And so if you only submitted your primary application and you didn't submit your secondary application, your application is not complete for that program. And they're going to wait until you submit the secondary application. And so it is also a very vital component of your application. A lot of schools will go directly to the secondary application to see how interested you are in their program. And so if you wrote a one sentence response to their question and they're, they're going to look at that, they're going to say, mm, this applicant is not really interested in our program and your application goes in the trash. And uh, so don't do that. Also, you want to keep in mind about the turnaround time. If you're waiting maybe like a month and a half to submit the secondary application, that might also show that you're not really interested in the program. And so you want to keep that in mind and you want to get back to them in a reasonable time frame. And you also want to want to make sure that it's well written. Uh, one tip that you could use is that when you are paying the secondary fee that comes with your secondary application, you can go directly to some of the school's websites and pay the fee directly from there. This will sort of allow you to skip the queue as some people or a lot of people are just going to be waiting for the email directly from the school in order to follow a link to submit the fee. And that's something that you want to keep in mind that can give you a slight edge. Um, when you're choosing schools, there are going to be many factors for you to consider. And I'm just going to go over a few that I thought were important. Um, for, so for example, cost. If cost is very important to you, you definitely want to be applying to your in-state school. It's going to be a lot cheaper. Additionally, you might want to look into schools that offer in-state tuition after first year. That's also going to save you a lot of money. You want to take into consideration the location. Um, are you going to be okay living in northern U.S. or are you going to be okay living in like the south where it's really warm? Um, is your family going to be nearby? Things like that. Um, you want to be looking at schools that are in-state, out-of-state, and international friendly. So obviously your in-state school is going to be good for you, but you want to take into consideration about other schools that you're applying to. Are they out-of-state friendly? So for example, you might look at if let's say you're a resident of New York, uh, New York State, and then you're looking at Texas schools. You're looking at that, you're saying, wow, 30K, that's awesome. 30K tuition a year, I'm definitely applying here. And then you look at their out-of-state acceptance rate and it's like between one to 3%, which essentially means almost not, you almost have no chance of getting in. And so that's something that you wanna keep in mind so you're making a more informed decision. Uh, also, you wanna keep in mind about the curriculum. Is it a medical school curriculum? Is it integrated? Is there anything unique about it? Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, you can find this information simply by Googling the school and typing curriculum and so usually something will pop up. You want to keep in mind about the grading scheme that the school uses. Is it honors pass-fail? Is it a pass-fail? Is it some sort of a hybrid? And this will probably cater more towards um, applicants who are seriously considering spe specializing in the future as those types of schools tend to produce more specialists as, um, the, as the environment that they produce allows you to sort of focus on other aspects. Um, such as research and uh, more community involvement, etc. Also, you want to consider the technology and facilities available. Are the facilities new? Is it a new building or is the building from like the 1900s? And what about the technology? Is it the latest CAD CAM technology or is it old technology? Um, and so whenever I was interviewing, I, I sort of expect to go to a school um, 
that's pretty brand new or renovated. Um, and so that was very important to me. Some schools that I interviewed at uh, had a very beat up uh, sim lab and that was not very attractive to me. Um, so that's something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, also the school's culture. Is it a, is it a collective culture? Um, or is it more of an individualistic culture? Um, and you can get a sense for that by talking to the students and during your interview day. Also keep in mind about the school's mission. What are they trying to accomplish? Are they just looking to produce general dentists or are they more focused on research? And so you wanna figure out what the school is trying to do and see if that sort of aligns with what you're looking for in a school. And so which schools should you apply to? Well, some guidelines that I can give you is you wanna to apply to a few schools, what I call reach schools. And these are schools that have stats that are above yours. You are gonna be mainly applying to schools within your academic range. And then you're also gonna to apply to a few schools that I call safety schools. Um, these are schools that are below your academic range. Also, a good ballpark number of schools to apply to is around eight to 14. And so, and so if let's say you're the average applicant, you'll probably be applying to around 10 schools, something along those lines. Um, you also wanna get feedback on your school list. You can get it from our Facebook page, uh, BAT Bootcamp st uh, Study Group. or um, or other Facebook pages or SDN. Um, however, do keep in mind that great academics never guarantee an interview. And so you might get rejected from your safety schools and that's okay. I got, I got rejected from a couple of mine and I got into uh, some of my reach schools. So good academics never guarantee an interview again. Uh, moving on, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the cost of the application process as a lot of students don't really take this into consideration at first. So it's gonna cost you some serious dough the first dental school program is going to cost you $245 to apply to, plus an additional $102 for every additional program. So if you're going to be applying to 10 schools, that's $1,100, that's over $1,100 just to apply to that program. Plus the secondary fees that come along with that, you're looking at a total of around $2,100 as the secondary fees range between $50 to over $150. Then we have flights, hotels, traveling expenses, all, all of this adds up. I mean, let's say that you're gonna attend five interviews. Um, so first you apply to 10 schools, that's $2,100. Plus you're gonna to go to five interviews. The, let's say the round trip costs are $250. Uh, and then let's say you stayed at a hotel and it wasn't like the Ritz Carlton or some expensive hotel, it was just your average show hotel, um, $80. You're looking at a ballpark number around $3,800 to get, to get through the interview, um, to get through the application cycle. The ADS has, um, the ADA does offer what's called a fee assistance program that you can look into. I don't know too much about it and the info is given here. Um, and these can sort of alleviate some of the costs that are associated with the application cycle. Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about interview invites. So traditionally, the first interview invites occur around late June for the mid-August timeframe. However, some schools may start interviewing in like October and other schools may be finishing in November. And so schools run on different timelines and they change year to year. A good place to see when schools traditionally give out interview invites is student doctor network under school specific discussions. You can go back to previous years and see when they gave out their interview invites or when they usually give out their interview invites. And this will give you sort of a general time frame. So that concludes this presentation. Um, thank you again uh, from BAT Bootcamp. Um, be sure to follow us on, on Instagram and Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube and like us on Facebook. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.